Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. This module will discuss buffers. If we look at some national research and survey data, we can see use of additives here used in the United States. Sodium bicarbonate is kind of the standard buffer used in dairy rations. If you look at all U.S. dairy herds, that number was about 46% in 2004. If you look at a survey of national high producing herds, that number is 78%. Therefore, you can see high producing herds tend to feed more buffer in their feeding programs. When looking at buffers, we can look at six characteristics to determine if you should be feeding them on your farm or to your clientele. One, how do they function? Two, what level to include? Third, what is the cost? Fourth, benefit to cost ratio. Fifth, strategy or when should you use it? And finally, sixth, what's the recommendation to include or not to include? When we look at the function of ruined buffers, its real function is to try to maintain the ruined pH at 6.25. For you chemists out there, that's a pKa, which means that's when it dissociates. So when the pH gets out of that range, it will chemically try to adjust it back to 6.25. You'll see why that's important in just a few minutes. If buffers are used properly, they should stimulate dry matter intake and improve rumen environment and fermentation profiles in the rumen. Let's look what happens in the rumen as it relates to time of feeding. In this research study from Kentucky, we can see rumen pH on the left side and time after feeding. This would be a component fed herd, which meant the grain is separated from the forages. You can see at time zero, the pH is over 6.4. About an hour and a half after feeding the, the list level of grain, rumen pH goes below six. That is our definition. Rumen acidosis is time under pH six. You can then see the hatched area continues on to about seven hours at which time the pH starts coming back up above 6. That occurs because no grain is being fed, the cow is cud chewing, adding sodium bicarb from her saliva, and of course absorbing VFAs out of the ruin. You can see after about 7 hours the pH goes above 6 and continues on up until 12 hours when she will be fed again. Notice in this study adding a buffer product in here, that pH never went below about 6.2 and that's the real benefit or function of a buffer is to try to keep that pH up at an optimal level for the room and microbes. So one of the questions might be, so if the pH goes below 6, what does that effect our acidosis have on the animals? It's huge. First, it shifts the rumen microbial population away from fiber digesting bacteria. As a result of that, it changes the VFA pattern, decreasing acetate production and stimulating or increasing propionate production. Thirdly, it slows down the rate of passage, a problem for high producing cows. And then finally, it reduces feed digestibility, especially the fiber fraction, which of course is our forages. If we look inside the cow's rumen, we can see what happens when the pH goes from 7 down to 5. This University of Illinois research measures the yield, which is grams of cells per gram of substrate provided to the cow. And you can see when the pH gets close to 6, the fiber digesting bacteria production goes down, or yield as we would say. Yield is important because 60% of the protein produced or needed by the cow is coming from rumen microbes. You can see when the pH goes down to about 5.5, uh, now my starch digesting bacteria start getting into trouble, and that would be true acidosis when we get below 5.5. Our challenge then is to feed the cow or add a buffer to try to keep that rumen pH above 6 so both groups of bacteria can thrive and produce VFAs and reproduce. Let's take a quick look then at research results in the Journal of Dairy Science. You can see this research was done many years ago, but really the principles are still correct today. In studies, you can see with over 2,000 cows, we saw an increase of about one kilogram or 2.2 pounds of milk on a three, five fat corrected milk basis. That's a pretty good number. This therefore has an increase also in butter fat test of about 0.08%. Some farmers will feed bicarb or buffer and see a big increase in butterfat test. That means we've got other problems on the farm. So then you might ask, well, what is this response worth then? This is worth about $2.30 for each dollar invested in your buffer product. And the levels in the ration should be somewhere around 0.3 to 0.5 pounds of bicarb or the guideline 0.75% of the total ration dry matter. 
Dr. Rich Erdman at Maryland did a wonderful study summarizing all the literature and asked the question, is there an impact of forage type? And you can see very clearly from these various research studies, corn silage is definitely a winner. You can see in the 17 different studies on average, an increase of about 1.3 pounds of milk, an increase of almost two tenths of a pound point, excuse me, and, and milk fat percentage, and certainly an increase in dry matter intake. So certainly if you're feeding a high corn silage based diets, for example, over 60% of the forage dry matter, you can almost anticipate or be guaranteed a positive response. Notice hay is very minor, and that's because bale hay tends to stimulate cud chewing. Haylage response is also marginal, but of course we depend a great deal on the particle size or length of chop of the silage and how wet the haylage would be. And of course, mixed silages meaning both corn silage and alfalfa has kind of a mixed pattern. So certainly you can see there'll be different strategies of when and when not to feed based on forage type. The next thing we might ask is what if I make a mistake and I do or do not feed it? This is now called a type one, type two error. This is based on 18 Journal of Dairy Science or Animal Science Research reports. The level of bicarb 0.75% of the total ration dry matter. The assumed cost of milk was 13 cents a pound or $13 per hundred weight. And the cost for feed was seven cents per pound of dry matter. Based on that research result and statistical analysis, one of two types of errors can occur. A type 1 error is there is no response, but you went ahead and fed a buffer product. In this study, that would cost you about four cents a day for making that error. The other error is, of course, you decide not to feed it, but the response was there. That would cost you 30 cents in lost milk production and profitability. So then you look at this and say, what is the risk of a type 1, type 2 error? And certainly, as you look a bit later, we'll give you some guidelines to try to minimize making either of these two errors. Next, let's talk about the amount of buffer you should be fed, a key slide. Remember, we have a rumen here that may have 200 pounds of fermenting feed each day in it. And so we're adding enough to impact the pH or maintain the pH in that rumen. Here are the various levels of products that are related to buffers. Sodium bicarbonate is kind of the gold standard. And again, you can see around four tenths to five tenths of a pound, a little bit less, of course, if there are lower producing cows. Sodium sesquicarbonate is actually a blend of sodium bicarbonate and sodium carbonate. And this is in the marketplace, generally a little bit cheaper than bicarb, not in quite the amount of work, but certainly a very good product. Magnesium oxide is an alkalizer, which means it tends to bring the pH on up. And of course, is a good source of magnesium as well. Normally, the ratio between sodium bicarbonate and magnesium oxide is three to one. You can see those numbers there in front of you. Sodium betonite is not a bu buffer, but it does have some impact on rate of passage and fermentation in the rumen. This Wisconsin research is a lot of sodium betonite. This is not used as a microtoxin binding agent in this role. Calcium carbonate is a buffer in the lower gut, primarily to maintain good starch absorption, not a true rumen buffer at all, but these are the levels you will tend to see. And potassium carbonate is a new kid on the block. Potassium carbonate is an excellent buffer it is more expensive, must be fed at a higher level, but important in heat stress. More about that in a few minutes. So now let's look at strategies. How do we prevent a type 1, type 2 error? First of all, we talked about the level. Make sure if you feed it, you feed enough. When would I anticipate a response to avoid a type 2 error? Rations that are modestly low in acid detergent fiber or neutral detergent fiber, defined here as 19 and 28% respectively. Effective NDF says particle size. So if our corn silage and haylage is chopped too short, that would also favor a response with sodium bicarbonate. Effective NDF, you will discover in a later module, is based on particle size length. If you feed more than six pounds of corn grain per meal, that or barley, that would be another reason why to include a buffer because of the slug feeding effect. This is exactly what you saw in the Kentucky study. And or if we feed high levels of concentrate relative to the rest of the diet, in this case, over 2% of the cow's body weight. This could apply very nicely to smaller cows, for example, Jersey cows. Also monitor dry matter intake. The research says buffers fed right should increase dry matter intake and under heat stress could be a very valuable tool to adjust the decad. More about that in a few minutes. 
The new role for buffers is heat stress. In many parts of the United States and Canada, we will see this as being a real problem. Cows under heat stress respond positively to a positive decad. Now, we're not talking dry cows. We're talking lactating cows. And that value should be higher than at least 250 milliequivalents per kilogram of dry matter the cow consumes. There is some research that even higher numbers may be beneficial. You would have to do that on a case-by-case -case basis. By doing this, though, we would anticipate an increase and dry matter intake, which translates into greater milk yield and improves blood gases. That's one of the problems under heat stress. These cows are panting, blowing off a lot of blood gases. So therefore, the new products on the market is a combination of sodium bicarbonate and potassium carbonate to raise both the potassium level over 1.2% of the total ration dry matter and sodium up around 0.4% of the total ration dry matter using these two buffer agents. So in summary, what is our take home messages with buffers? We certainly know that buffer use and responses will probably increase in the future and have more importance as cows eat more dry matter, therefore pushing feed through the rumen quicker. Rumen pHs will drop as dry matter increases and we also know heat stress will increase the acid load on cow and the blood gases itself. Second of all, we know that buffer intake is related to dry matter intake. Therefore, you should be feeding more buffer today than you did, for example, 10 years ago because cows eat more feed. Next, we know corn silage is almost a no-brainer. So if you're feeding modestly to high levels of corn silage as your forage program, you should look at it. And the economics are very favorable. The benefit to cost ratio can vary from 4 to 1 to 8 to 1. Well, that completes this module on buffers. Thanks. Have a great day.